come back in good time to start. <clears throat> and now it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2018 Summer School. My name is Ingrid Fisk, and I worked at Extramural Studies in its various incarnations for over 20 years until I took early retirement. And it's a particular pleasure to be here in a different capacity. I have no responsibilities <laughs> apart from praising Jean. And it's very good to see so many familiar faces and also, of course, many new ones. It's a very special honor to have been asked to introduce to you Dr. Jean Moorcroft Wilson. Um, I've known her a long time. I admire her very much. And she's at summer school we've worked out for her 10th time. Um, very good. And she still wears hats. She will be giving a full five lecture series next week on what in the brochure is called Gardens in Literature, but her original title, which I think is much better, is Gardens Behind the Plot. Um, but today, it's not a one-hour lecture. As I said, it's a two-hour lecture um, about First World War poets whose extraordinary, that time, that produced extraordinary writers whose lives and imaginations and imaginative documentation of their experiences changed forever the way we think about that war and possibly war in general. After their evidence, especially Wilfred Owens, no more unquestioning acceptance for us of the old lie, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. Apart from her writing on Virginia Woolf, essential reading, I must say, Jean is an expert on the poets of the First World War. Having written highly regarded biographies and other material, about all the poets of the period she will speak about. Many of you will know her biographies on Secret Sassoon, Isaac Rosenberg, <clears throat> Edward Thomas and others. And I know she's busy working on the complex figure of Robert Graves and she says that actually she has a week to finish the biography. Um, so if, she, yeah, so she might just start talking about that instead of giving the lectures. You might not know that with her boundless energy and commitment to letters. She has also edited collections of work entitled Authors Take Sides on the Falklands and Authors Take Sides on Iraq and the Gulf War. Wars other than the First World War and the imaginative literature generated by war are topics of continuing interest to her. And poetry is her special love. One poet, one of my favorites, and whom Jean also admires, but about whom she will probably only quote briefly today, because he was not a combatant, he was an old man when the 1418 war took place. That man is Thomas Hardy. Many of you will know his poignant short poem in Time of Breaking of the Nations, written in 1915, a poem which claims that the continuity of ordinary life is not entirely affected, I've left my second page here, is not entirely affected by the travails of war. However, that's one very quiet version of his, of his understanding of war. Because you, in that poem, there's an old man who's harrowing clods, there's a young couple who are whispering to each other, and he says their lives will continue and will cloud war's annals into night. However, the poem Channel Firing has a very different understanding of the nature of war. That was written in 1914, and it's much darker, and it shares more, I think, with the poetry you will encounter today. There he invokes the buried dead, whose coffins in their country graveyard are shaken by the guns firing across the channel, and who wake disturbed to ask God if judgment day has come. God, in quite a chatty way, replies that no, it's gunnery practice out at sea, just as before you went below, the world is as it used to be. All nations striving strong to make red war yet redder. The dead lie down after further discussion with God, and the poem continues thus. I wonder what the, will the world ever say be, said one, Then when he sent us under 
in our indifferent century. We, in our also indifferent century, new century, will listen to Jean to understand how great poetic minds constructed and deconstructed the horrors of one of the most devastating modern wars. And perhaps for insights too about the human consequences of those wars, alas, still to come. Please welcome Jean Moorcroft Wilson. There's nothing quite like not having a voice, is there, to make you want to say all sorts of things. And uh, one of them I wanted to say was, well done, Ingrid, because she's mentioned Thomas Hardy, and one of the poems I'm going to read is by Edward Thomas replying to Thomas Hardy. So now you have no excuse for not knowing what Thomas Hardy said. Um, well, it's a great pleasure to be back, of course, um, particularly because it's my 10th anniversary. Um, I shouldn't really be here, I should really be finishing that book on Robert Graves, you know, but I couldn't resist you. <laughs> um, and my lecture is a digest, nicely so I think, uh, well nicely in the sense that it's appropriate, it's a digest of that first lecture series I gave ten years ago, which was called Soldier Poets. And so it is a particular pleasure to come back. And if any of you have really good memories, please forgive me, because some of it will be repeated. I've really enjoyed preparing this course, despite my guilt over graves, because in the course of it, I have... Sorry, you, didn't mention, you did mention Gardens Behind the Plots. In the course of preparing next week's lectures, I've met, sort of by email, you know, uh, I've met Tan Tuan Eng, who's turned out to be a huge friend and fan and who says, um, I'm so sorry I can't be there. Can you imagine me on Friday giving a lecture about his book in front of him? I'm so glad he can't come. <laughs> but he is also, he sent all his best wishes for the course and hopes that it will all be as successful as he thinks it will be. I think his book is particularly marvellous. And if you go to Fanula's lecture on Friday, I will never forgive you. <laughs> I know you will, and of course I'll forgive you. Okay, let's get down to more serious stuff. The First World War was a milestone, not only in English history, but also in literature. Unlike the wars which had preceded it, this was a total war. And one which no one could ignore, soldiers or civilians alike. Millions of mainly men, although of course we do know very moving stories of women who served and who also died in that war, had died fighting by the end of it, and countless more were injured. It's noticeable, however, that the most powerful literature to come out of the war, though not exclusively written by combatants, and you've just heard an example of that, um, is almost all, 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 was almost all, by those who had fought in it, and the reason is not difficult to find. It was surely their heightened response in the war which stimulated them to new flights of imagination. And although the poetry itself is not particularly experimental. Some of it is. I mean, I would put up my favourite and your favourite, because he's a Cape Town poet, Isaac Rosenberg, here. But although it's not all experimental by any means, it deals with themes which appeal universally. It's certainly not epic poetry, as, as I'll, I'll discuss. And the poetry written during the war is, is particularly powerful, written under great stress, not always in the trenches, I have to admit, but written immediately in the aftermath of that experience. Quite apart from its high overall intrinsic value, this poetry studied chronologically, and this is important, I think, gives a fascinating insight into changing attitudes towards the war, which in turn mirror the development of the war itself. I shall therefore approach the subject chronologically. 
as far as I possibly can, and you'll realize that I'll have to split so soon, because he's two poets, really. He's a poet who is glorying in war and courage and valor and honor, and then he's a poet who is condemning war and protesting against it. I think the dividing line for most people, certainly most popular dividing line, is the Somme, although Robert Graves, on whom I've just been working, would say that it was the Battle of Loos. And Edward Blunden, Edmund Blunden, who was in the Battle of Passchendaele, um, or Ypres, would say that it was Passchendaele. But there are these dividing lines, and it's, although it may not be exactly the Somme, it's certainly round about the end of 1915, beginning of and in 1916, that attitudes towards war changed. Dividing poets like Rupert Brooke, Julian Grenfell, Charles Hamilton Sawley, the first generation, as it were, from the second generation, from the later Sassoon, Robert Graves, Edward Thomas, Isaac Rosenberg, and Wilfred Owen, and those are the poets I shall discuss. I know there are other wonderful poets. I know that we should be talking about Ivor Gurney. I know we should be talking about that incredibly difficult poet, David Jones, but we're not. We're going to, to concentrate on these because I would like to say a little bit about some of their poetry too. The era immediately preceding the 1914 war was, on the whole, a period of low vitality for poetry. And it may have needed something as shocking and unavoidable as a world war, and this is the first world war, as it, as it says, to bring life back into poetry. That is not to say that the poetry of this turbulent time is without faults. I think one of the, the faults, uh, perhaps, is that in the stress of battle, there isn't time to compose a huge epic in the manner of Homer or Virgil. We, we, we get lyric poetry on the whole. We get lyric poetry that deals in very personal themes. They deal, these lyrics, mainly with a range of personal experiences, subjective and impressionistic in kind, marked by emotional excess sometimes, admittedly, and motivated by disillusionment, anger, or pity. We'll come to that famous statement in a minute. In other words, it lacks the universality that I've just mentioned in works like Homer's Iliad or Virgil's Aeneid. A further contrast to previous war literature lies in the, those largely negative themes of First World War. Earlier writers, um, people like Tennyson, who in fact was a non-combatant, uh, but earlier writers had glorified war. You know, the, um, the, into the battle rode the 500, don't you? We all know, we all know that. Um, they, they glorified as an heroic occupation, a test of individual worth, whereas modern writers have, for the most part, de-glorified war, and you might say, rightly, I certainly would, stripped it of its romantic and adventurous aspects to emphasize its futility, to show it as shameful and degrading. I think they do that very successfully. For the nature of modern warfare, mechanization, the increased size of armies, making for a kind of depersonalization to a large extent, the intensification of operations, and the scientific efficiency of long-distance weapons, destroyed some of the very elements of human individuality, such as courage and hope, enterprise, which had given previous combatants a certain glory and heroism, or in other people's eyes, and possibly even in their own. The 20th century soldier, therefore, is seen mainly as a passive and often degraded victim of circumstances. Sassoon's infantrymen succumb to hysteria, commit suicide, or die ignominiously. Cold-footed swine is one phrase he uses about one of them. Owen describes the humiliations and inevitability of such horrors as mutilation or poison gas. 
And Rosenberg shows the degradation rather than the glory of those who die in battle. Very powerful poem called Dead Man's Dump, where the, the limber cart is actually driving over the bodies of the dead, and he's hearing them crunch the bones as they go over. Above all, the poets emphasize the demoralizing effect of modern warfare, the very opposite to that glorification that it had started out with. As fine a poet and critic as W.B. Yeats claimed, and I know you'll know this, when rejecting most of First World War poetry for the, Ox the modern Oxford book, sorry, the book of the Oxford book of modern verse, Yeats said, when asked why he'd missed out people like Siegfried Sassoon, for example, he said, passive suffering is not a theme for poetry. Well, you may or may not agree with that. As I hope to show, however, by no means all of the poems which came out of the First World War can be dismissed so confidently. Though many of them are limited by their highly subjective approach, there are others which undoubtedly rise above such limitations to provide some of the finest poems of the 20th century. It is dif difficult for a modern reader to cast their mind back to look back, as we do, on two horrifying First World Wars. It's very difficult to understand how those young men in 1914 could be so excited about the prospect of going to war, which they were. They greeted the advent of the First World War, which started, as you know, on August the 4th, for the British anyway. They greeted it with great excitement and enthusiasm. And when England declared war against Germany that night, the night of August the 4th, 1914, almost the whole nation was carried away by a burst of popular enthusiasm that has few parallels in modern history. Rosenberg wasn't because he was here in South Africa, so he wasn't quite caught up in that fervor. This outburst of patriotism was caused partly by righteous indignation against Germany's violation of Belgium's neutrality. That was the sparking point for the British, that they had invaded a country that was neutral. Europe generally had pledged to protect that and respect that neutrality. But it was partly fueled by a sense of relief at being committed after what was quite a long period of indecision on Britain's part to a clear course of action, and partly by a sense of emotional solidarity in exerting the common will at a time when England was divided by bitter internal disagreements. So it was quite an answer to several problems in the country. English people were for the most part united by a mounting hatred of the enemy. And of course, you know, for somebody half German like Robert Graves, this was a problem and was probably one reason he enlisted. You had to show that you were on the British side. Charles Hamilton Sawley had been in Germany when, when war was declared, and he too had a sense of divided loyalty. Everything German was shunned. Everything German was condemned. Even their wonderful music, and this includes Austria, because, of course, we, we, they are German-speaking. We think of them as Germany. White feathers presented to those who did not volunteer as a sign of cowardice. Any able-bodied young man was expected to be at the front fighting for his country. If you had two legs, two arms, and you looked vaguely under the age of 40, you were certainly condemned if you didn't fight. And there's a marvelous, I think, a marvelous example of this in a very popular poet, and beware popular poets sometimes, called Jesse Pope. And she wrote a poem called The Call. Who's for the trench? <clears throat> Are you, my laddie, who'll follow the French? Will you, my laddie, who's fretting to begin? Who's going out to win and who wants to save his skin? Do you, my laddie? Who's for the khaki suit? Are you, my laddie? Who longs to charge and shoot? Do you, my laddie? Who's keen on getting fit? Who means to show his grit? And who'd rather wait a bit? Do you, my laddie? Who'll earn the empire's thanks? Will you, my laddie? Who'll swell the victor's ranks? Will you, my laddie? 
When that procession comes, banners and rolling drums, who'll stand and bite his thumbs? Will you, my laddie? Terrible poem to read if you're hesitating, isn't it? There was little need for white feathers at first, however. For most young men, excited by the moral issue over Belgium, and stimulated by the thought of a radical change in their circumstances. After all, you might go abroad for a lot of English working class men. This was very exciting. The government had appealed for men to reinforce the rather battered expeditionary force of the regular army because England didn't have a standing army. It just had a small regular army and there wasn't conscription of any kind. There wasn't national service of any kind. But the Germans did, and the English had retired, retreated in late August, so only a few weeks into the war, before General von Kluck's superior, more efficient German First Army at the Battle of Mons. So after that, it became very important for Kitchener to get up and, and appeal for all those posters. Um, and there is one observer, contemporary observer, a man called C.E. Montague, writer, who's left us a clear picture of the prevailing attitude at the time. All the air was ringing with rousing assurances. France to be saved, Belgium righted, freedom and civilization re-won. A sour, soiled, crooked old world to be rid of bullies and crooks and reclaimed for straightness, decency, good nature the ways of common men, dealing with common men. I think that sums it up very well indeed. The young university men who, as you'll see, make up the core of the war poets were among the most enthusiastic and quickly joined Kitchener's army, Kitchener's new army. So this is one that will reinforce the expeditionary army. Far from considering themselves victims robbed of promising careers, which is, of course, how we see them now, they were almost all proud, at least to begin with, to sacrifice themselves for the nation. Thomas Hardy, who was, as Ingrid has indicated, too old to fight, perfectly expresses the righteous crusading spirit of the first few weeks of the war in a poem published in the Times on September the 9th, 1914, so that's just over a month after the war has been declared. Men who march away. His jingoism, or his patriotism, I should call it more neutrally, seems to me to reach its climax in stanza four. In our heart of hearts, believing victory crowns the just, and that braggarts must surely bite the dust press we to the field, ungrieving, in our heart of hearts, believing victory crowns the just. And Charles Hamilton Sawley, who, as you will see, was one of the first to say, hang on a minute, let's look at this, who never really experienced this initial fervor, and despite admiring Hardy very much indeed, said that victory crowns the just was the worst line Hardy ever wrote. <coughs> As you see, he has written others. Yet it was not only the older men, the older non-combatants, who wrote in such fervid vein. Even the younger soldier poets could be set on fire by the red-hot enthusiasm of the time. And you know what I'm going to say. I'm sure you do. You know that I'm going to start with dear old Rupert Brooke. Um, 1887 to 1915. I want to look at him first for obvious reasons. He perfectly echoed the mood of the moment in his sonnet, Peace. When the metaphor of a swimmer into cleanness leaping must have seemed ironic in retrospect to those who were to experience the filth and dirt of the trenches. Now God be thanked who has matched us with this hour sorry, matched us with his hour, and caught our youth and wakened us from sleeping with hand made sure, clear eye and sharpened power to turn as swimmers into cleanness leaping, glad from a world grown old and cold and weary, leave the sick hearts that honour could not move and half men 
and their dirty songs and dreary and all the little emptiness of love. Oh, we who have known shame, we have found release there where there's no ill, no grief, but sleep has mending. Naught broken, save this body, lost, but breath. Nothing to shake the laughing heart's long peace there, but only agony, and that has ending. And the worst friend and enemy is but death. Brooke, who'd been born into the upper middle classes, and received a privileged public school and university education at, came, at um, Rugby and King's College, Cambridge, was 27 when war broke out. He just returned from an extended and very exciting trip to um, America, Canada, and the South Seas. And he'd returned to take up a fellowship at King's College. But you note that second date, 1915, that's when he died. And he had joined the Anson Battalion, which was the 63rd Royal Naval Division, an infantry battalion which originally formed as a naval division and fought at Antwerp and Gallipoli. So he'd seen a little action from afar at Antwerp. But as he himself admitted, he was barely even under fire. And of course, when he came to write his five sonnets, which were written in the autumn of 1914, of which Peace is one of them, he, he, he didn't have the experience, and I think we can explain that. It wasn't that he was stupid, or it wasn't that he was unrealistic, it was that he hadn't experienced war in the way we think of it. And of course, that became enormously popular, that 1914 sequence of sonnets, of which this is one. Um, think of the, the fifth sonnet, I won't quote it in full. If I should die, the soldier, do you know it? If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. It had a huge appeal, as you can imagine. Had Brooke lived to experience the horrifying battlefield of the River Ancre with his battalion in the winter, of 1916, he would probably have written very differently, as his last poem, Fragment, suggests. He's on his way to Gallipoli, which he never reaches because he dies of septicemia before he gets there. I strayed about the deck an hour tonight under a cloudy moonless sky and peeped in at the windows, watching my friends at table or playing cards or standing in the doorway coming out into the darkness, still no one could see me. I would have thought of them, heedless within a week of battle, in pity, pride in their strength, and in the weight and firmness and linked beauty of bodies, and pity that this gay machine of splendor soon be broken, thought little of, pashed, scattered, only always I could but see them against the lamplight pass like colored shadows, thinner than filmy glass, slight bubbles, fainter than the wave's faint light that broke to phosphorus out in the night, perishing things and strange ghosts, soon to die to other ghosts, this one or that or I. It's very different, isn't it, in feel to peace. And as you know, he died prematurely a few weeks after writing that, possibly even a week after writing it, and was buried romantically in the beautiful Greek island of Skiros, probably mispronouncing it. Though Brooke's enormous popularity would continue right up to the end of the Second World War in 1945, his attitude would be questioned and rejected, even within that First World War, by poets more experienced in the realities of the war than he was. Siegfried Sassoon would be chief among them. Before then, however, there are two rather fascinating poets, and one of them was in South Africa when war broke out. Not Rosenberg, Julian Grenfell. And it's quite different kind of poetry. I, I love Into Battle. I don't know whether you know it or not. Here is Grenfell himself. He was a regular soldier. And 
here is his poem. At first glance, his poetry seems to be very similar to that of Brooks, but I think it's, its patriotic fervor, of course, is very similar and apparently joyful acceptance of war. Looked at more closely, however, Grenfell's attitude differs subtly from Brooks and is based on very different experiences because he speaks as a regular soldier, somebody who has chosen war as his occupation, like Brooke. He didn't live to have the full experience of the First World War. He was born in 1888, the eldest son and heir of William Henry Grenfell, Lord Desborough. As befitted his aristocratic background, he'd been to Eton and to um, Balliol College, Oxford, and showed great aptitude. One of those infuriating people who are good at both lessons and games, you know? One of those golden young men rather like Brooke, blessed by the gods. His love of action attracted him to a military career, possibly unhappiness at home, and in 1910 he joined the Royal Dragoons, a cavalry regiment. Well, that's a lovely outdated notion, isn't it? A cavalry regiment. I mean, they got rid of the cavalry about halfway through the First World War. He was unique then among the, the soldier poets in starting as a regular soldier. And when his regiment was moved to South Africa in 1911, he wrote to his family, I love, I'm so happy here, I love the profession of arms, and I love my fellow officers and all my dogs and all my horses. He seems to have had a genuine enthusiasm for the imperialist ideal. Please forgive him for that. And when war broke out three years later, he wrote again from South Africa. And don't you think, can't you imagine him, this, the, the, the son of a lord, you know? And don't you think it has been a wonderful, almost incredible rally to the empire with Redmond's and, Redmond and the Hindus and Will Crooks and the Boers, the Boers and South Fiji Islanders all aching to come and throw stones at the Germans such schoolboyish language. It reinforces one's failing belief in the old flag and the mother country and the heavy brigade and the, and the thin red line and all the imperial idea, which gets rather shadowy in peacetime, don't you think? But this has proved a real enough thing. By early October 1914, Grenfell was in France where he felt he could at least test himself to the full. Here we are, he wrote, in the burning centre of it all, and I would not be anywhere else for a million pounds and the Queen of Sheba. I have never, never felt so well or so happy or enjoyed anything so much. It just suits my stolid health and my stolid nerves and barbaric disposition. The fighting excitement vitalises everything every sight and word and action. It was not as though, like Brooke, Grenfell did not see action, so he hasn't that excuse, I think. Even in the midst of extreme discomfort, he could still write, I adore war. It's like a big picnic without the objectlessness of a picnic. It's hard to believe he wrote this, isn't it? I have never been so well or so happy. Nobody grumbles at one for being dirty. I've only had my boots off once in the last 10 days and only washed twice. Do you think he came from Cape Town? Yeah. And uh, we are up and standing to our rifles by 5 a.m. And when doing, it, when doing infantry work and saddled up by 4.30, when with our horses. Our poor horses do not get their saddles off when we are in the trenches. <laughs> He's more sympathetic towards the horses. Grenfell probably felt that for once he had come up against a worthwhile challenge, one into which he could channel the boundless energies he certainly possessed. He seemed ideally suited to the physical hardships of war. And when the Royal Dragoons, like many other cavalry units, were converted to an infantry regiment, he made a speciality of stalking German snipers, Indian style, and shooting at them at point blank range. That's the kind of gung ho warrior he was. Not surprisingly, he was recommended twice in dispatches 
and by December 1914 had won a Distinguished Service Order Medal, which is a very high honor, a great achievement. After some time in the trenches, however, Grenfell began to suspect that war was not quite the simple, heroic affair he had thought it, and yet he remained basically romantic in his concept of war. And this comes out very clearly in the one poem for which he is remembered into battle. To Grenfell, it seems, war is a mystical experience, linking him more closely to nature in a strange way. It reminds me, when I read it, of ancient heroes and warriors fighting with an elemental sim simplicity, which I'm sure doesn't exist, but which they make it seem it might. Denied to the modern soldier caught up in the complex machinery of 20th century warfare. And this was written at Ypres in 1915. The naked earth is warm with spring, and with green grass and bursting trees, leans to the sun's gaze, glorying, and quivers in the sunny breeze. And life is color and warmth and light, and a striving evermore for these. And he is dead who will not fight, and who dies fighting has increase. The fighting man shall from the sun take warmth, and life from the glowing earth. Speed with the light foot winds to run and with the trees to newer birth, and find when fighting shall be done great rest and fullness after death. All the bright company of heaven hold him in their high comradeship. The dog star and the sister seven, Orion's built belt and sordid hip. The woodland trees that stand together, they stand to him, each one a friend, they gently speak in the windy weather. They guide to valley and ridges end. The kestrel hovering by night, sorry, the kestrel hovering by day and the little owls that call by night, bid him be swift and keen as they, as keen of ear, as swift of sight. The blackbird sings to him, brother, brother, if this be the last song you shall sing, sing well, for you may not sing another, brother, sing. In dreary, doubtful waiting hours before the brazen frenzy starts, the horses show him nobler powers, O oh, patient eyes, courageous hearts. And when the burning moment breaks and all things else are out of mind, and only joy of battle takes him by the throat and makes him blind, through joy and blindness he shall know, not caring much to know, that still nor lead nor steel shall reach him so that it be not the destined will. The thundering line of battle stands, and in the day, death in the air, death moans and sings. But day shall clasp him with strong hands, and night shall fold him in soft wings. Of all the poets who died before the Battle of the Somme revealed the full horrors of war, Charles Hamilton Sawley, 1895 to 1915 is the most unusual, for he realized from the very beginning the nightmarish implications of war. And as he says very cynically right at the beginning, even when he joins up, war in England only means putting all the men of military age into a state of routine coma preparatory to getting them killed. And that was before the song. That was long before Luce. It may be that his ancestry counts, accounts for some extent, to some extent for this, because he was Scottish. He'd been in Germany when war broke out, and he loved being in Germany. He loved their music. He loved their attitude to things. He thought they were so much more sportsmanlike than the English. And his first feeling of patriotism, he said, came to him in Germany when the Germans sang. I know what he means, don't you? Oh, Tannenbaum, sung by a group of German um, men in a choir is really quite an experience. He didn't feel patriotic, therefore, towards England, but he had been to public school, Marlborough, with a scholarship on to Oxford to follow. And so he knew that, you know, play up, play up, and play the game was the kind of thing that was expected of him. He suffered, of course, a strong conflict of loyalties, since as a Scot, 
it never really identified. Even after joining the regiment, the Suffolk, the 7th Suffolk Regiment, as a, a trained officer, he still felt a conflict of loyalties. He could not believe that the Germans were all evil. As sorely. And here is one of his early poems about the war. To Germany. You are blind like us. You hurt no man designed, and no man claimed the conquest of your land. But gropers both through fields of thought confined we stumble, and we do not understand. You only saw your future bigly planned, and we the tapering paths of our own mind. And in each other's dearest ways we stand and hiss and hate and the blind fight the blind. Too many good poems to read all of that. But the poems that he wrote later on was perhaps more explicit. They certainly show that he had no illusions about war. He wrote two sonnets when he got out to France and he starts one of them such, such is death. No triumph, no defeat. Only an empty pail, a slate rubbed clean, a merciful putting away of what has been. And such was his attitude as he helped to reinforce the trenches around the loose Lens area in September and October 19, 1915. He, he went out there in August 1915 from another part of France and proved so, you know, the irony of these things, he proved so efficient that he was promoted to captain. And as captain, when his own captain died, he, so he became the captain, but his leave was deferred. And so he was there for the ending, the bloody ending of the Battle of Luz and was killed instantly on October the 13th, 1915. And I think he himself has written the best possible memorial to his sceptical yet caring and highly sensitive spirit. A sonnet found in his kit bag after his death. You know those lovely stories about what was found in the kit bag after death. In which he makes his final answer, as I see it, to Brooke's romantic concept and notion of death. And you'll hear echoes of Brooke, I hope, in the poem itself thus placing himself firmly, despite the early date, in the line of war poets who are protesting after this point about war itself. When you see millions of the mouthless dead. When you see millions of the mouthless dead across your dreams in pale battalions go, say not soft things, as other men have said, that you'll remember. For you need not so. Give them not praise. For death, how should they know it is not curses heaped on each gashed head, nor tears? Their blind eyes see not your tears flow, nor honour. It is easy to be dead. Say only this, they are dead. Then add thereto, yet many a better man has died before. Then scanning all the o'ercrowded mass should you perceive one face you loved heretofore, it is a spook. None wears the face you knew. Great death has made all his forevermore. And it is Sassoon who has survived as the best known prototype, I think, of that early prophetic war poet. Um, not Sawley, which I find rather strange, because it was Sawley, in fact, who, who started it. And here is Sassoon. He started by being hugely patriotic. He joined up, he enlisted the day before war was declared, if you can imagine it, and his subsequent disillusionment, I think, probably made him more fierce than he would have been had he not felt so patriotic to begin with. He began his army career as a trooper in his local cavalry regiment, the Sussex Yeomanry, 
which allowed him to keep his beloved horse, Cockbird, with him. That was the only reason he joined the yeomanry, because they would allow you to keep your horse. Um, but also, no, perhaps also because he didn't want the responsibility of being an officer. He'd been to Marlborough himself, he'd been to Cambridge University, so he had all the qualifications. He had the social background, which I'm afraid was what counted in those days, and yet he went in as a trooper into the yeomanry. And it was only when he realized that it was too much for his horse, sounds a bit like Grenfell, doesn't it, caring more for the horse than for anything else. It was only then that he decided to become an infantryman and to become an officer. Um, and that, th this was when he wrote his first poem, real war poem, Absolution, a very different work from those which have made him famous. Because in this poem, you don't get an answer to Brooke. You actually get a brook-like enthusiasm for death and glory and honor. The anguish of the earth absolves our eyes, note, note the religious language as we go through, till beauty shines in all that we can see. War is our scourge, yet war has made us wise, and fighting for our freedom, we are free. Horror of wounds and anger at the foe and loss of things desired all these must pass. We are the happy legion, for we know times but a golden wind that shakes the grass. There was an hour when we were loath to part from life we longed to share no less than others. Now, having claimed this heritage of heart, what need we more, my comrades and my brothers? Like Brooks, these are rousing sentiments. But as so soon afterwards realized, they are, quote, two nobly worded lines. Looked at more closely, it also seems to me that the language is somewhat cliched, um, certainly rhetorical in the way that perhaps peace is. It suggests that Sassoon's response by mid 1915 was still largely unconsidered and untested. He's writing the kind of rousing war poetry that he thinks he ought to be writing. The conventional reaction of a member of the ruling classes, some might even say gung-ho. So soon later described these feelings as typical of the self-glorifying feeling, feelings of a young man about to go to the front for the first time. He managed to retain these idealistic views even after his younger brother, Hamo, to whom he was close, had died on his way back, wounded from Gallipoli in November 1915, as his poem to my brother shows. But his views began to change noticeably once he was posted to Festubert in France in late 1915 to join the first Royal Welsh Fusiliers, and it was here that he met the poet that I'm going to discuss in between, Robert Graves, because Graves had started off in a very different frame of mind from Sassoon, and Graves had been out longer, and that, I think, is the key to it. Once you were out there, once you saw, particularly if, like Sassoon, you felt tremendous empathy and sympathy for your men, I think it was very difficult to see them suffering the conditions of the trenches, and it completely changed Sassoon's attitude and that of many other soldiers. It was partly as a result of talking to Graves and reading some of his starkly realistic poems that Sassoon began to feel the inadequacy of his own war poetry, which in no way reflected the reality of the trenches. I mean, he gets out to the trenches and he can't believe it. These are the, all the, the glorious things he's been writing about, and it just doesn't bear it out. Robert Graves, um, who, as I said to you, had a half-German um, parentage. His mother was German, aristocratic German, born in 1895, like Charles Hamilton Sawley, was 19, just 19, when the war broke out. He'd left school a month before. He was critical of war, but like his other 
um, com uh, compatriots, like people who had been with him at Charterhouse, another public school, and who would be with him at Oxford, where he was due to go on an exhibition, he felt that it was his duty to join up. Partly, I think, encouraged or at least made necessary by the fact that his mother was German. He had to show that where his loyalties lay. And of all the war poets, I think he expresses, he expresses most brutally what it was like to be in the war. Sassoon had never seen a poem like this before. A dead Bosch, that was the word people used for the Germans in those days. To you who'd read my songs of war and only hear of blood and fame, I'll say, you've heard it said before, war's hell. And if you doubt the same, today I found in Mamet's wood a certain cure for lust of blood. Where, propped against a shattered trunk in a great mess of things unclean, sat a dead Bosch. He scowled and stunk, with clothes and face a sodden green, big-bellied, spectacled, crop-haired, dribbling black blood from nose and beard. Well, you can't get more realistic than that can you? And it's rather opposite to what Sassoon had been writing about the glory of the earth absolves our eyes. Couldn't have a stronger contrast. Curiously enough, this was not characteristic of Graves' poetry, and it was just chance, really, that Sassoon met Graves at a time when he was writing realistic poetry. Because, on the whole, Graves is much less aggressively realistic than Sassoon or Rosenberg, or Owen. In fact, Graves is remembered in the First World War more for his prose account, which I'm sure you know, goodbye to all that, than for his poetic account of it. And Graves himself, when first making a selection of his poems, almost entirely omitted his war poetry from his works because he says he didn't want to be known by war poetry for a whole host of reasons, which you'll have to read when my book comes out. But the poetry is extremely interesting, and I think some of the most successful, once you get to grips with it, of the First World War. Um, you know, perhaps, a little about Graves from his book that he was born in... Um, suburban London, Wimbledon, 1895, that he went to public school, I've told you that. Um, and he came from a very distinguished family of Irish scholars and clerics and people who, and doctors, people who had succeeded in life. He had a huge amount of confidence, which helped him. Um, and he didn't want to go to Oxford. He was rebelling at school, quite a common phenomenon. And he decided he didn't want to go to Oxford, but there he was on his way. And then war broke out. And, of course, this was the perfect excuse. And he joined up, and he went out in 1915, in mid-1915. Uh, he was particularly affected by the death of Charles Hamilton Sawley, because he... In 19, November 1915, he went out the same month as Sawley, and in November 1915, he was at the same battle at which Sawley was killed and wrote a delightful poem about Sawley's weather. Not my kind of weather, windy, gusty, cold, but Sawley's weather. After Luce, Graves spent nine months mainly in England training and training other people, and then went back in time for some of the Battle of the Somme. He arrived at, in about mm, 10th, 10th of July, and the battle had started on the 1st of July, so he missed the worst part. But in defending High Wood, he was wounded very badly through the lungs and was given up for dead, an experience which I think provided a great many poems in the future for him. This idea that one is dead and that one rises again, of course, particularly in war, uh, fascinated him for the rest of his life. And he was taken back to England and 
spent a long time recuperating, but still in the army. And he stayed in the army until a few months after war was finished. So he's one of the war poets probably best qualified to talk about the war. Um, he'd seen real fighting by the time he was wounded and came back to England. And his attitude towards the war was hardened considerably. There was no glory or honor in it for him anymore. But this doesn't show him itself as grim realism. It shows himself as a desire to talk about it, but to talk about it in a way that his classically trained, very imaginative mind considered more effective. And that was through allegory. You know the story of something which relates to what you're saying, but which isn't the thing itself. So he doesn't talk about a dead Bosch anymore. He talks, for instance, in a poem like um, Dead Cow Farm, which puzzled me for a very long time. He talks about an old Scandinavian myth in which the first god or god was a, was a, was a woman, a cow, and an ancient tar saga, and, and licks life into the earth by licking the stones. And I think for him it was wonderful because he was on the, on the, first, on the front in the First World War and one of the posts was called Dead Cow Farm. And of course with his allegorical mind that took him back to Scandinavian myth and this whole idea of the first god being a cow and licking life into the stones. But you see how the poem ends. I don't think God survives this experience on the Western Front. An ancient saga, I haven't got it up here. An ancient saga tells us how in the beginning, the first cow, for nothing living yet had birth, but elemental cow on earth, began to lick cold stones and mud under her warm tongue, flesh and blood blossomed, a miracle to believe. And so was Adam born and Eve. Here now, of course, the Western Front, is chaos once again. Primeval mud, cold stones and rain. Here flesh decays and blood drips red. And the cow's dead. The old cow's dead. And of course, that expression, the old cow, is particularly sneering and nasty, isn't it? Um, and that was the kind of poem, I think, where his true ability came out. The the other one that he wrote, which I think is it's, it's rather longer, and I won't read the whole of it by any means, but the other one he wrote is similarly an allegory. It's, um, it's based on an incident which had happened just before the Battle of the Somme, when his great friend David Thomas, he was in love, he, was a, he believed himself to be homosexual at the time and was in love with David Thomas, this young subaltern. At the same time, Siegfried Sassoon, who was homosexual, also believed himself to be in love with David Thomas. You can quite imagine the situation, can't you? And, and when David died, both of them were completely devastated. I think David Thomas must have generated more war poetry than anybody else I know. Sassoon must have written at least five. Um, but what he did was, he wrote to his mother and he said, and I think this is so lovely, he said um, that David was the kind of of young man that everybody loved. Everybody couldn't resist him. He was so sunny and open. His death then devastated him, but when he wrote about it, he didn't write about the death of his best friend. He started, he started by setting it in the trenches, you know, the way you would expect a conventional war poem to go. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful draft I discovered, I feel I'm the first person to discover it. Of course I feel I'm the first person to discover it. Um, in which the poem, which doesn't bear any resemblance to what emerges, is, starts a crash, a cry, a sudden shout, and running feet by my dugout, a wild face torn from cheek to chin, spurting the blood in jets broke in, and gurgling blood, I'm killed, he cries, throws forward blindly, chokes and dies. David's clean beauty ripped away. The man who wrote the Bible lied. Now that's how he began it. And then I think he realized that there's just too much battering at the emotions and he needed allegory. And he turns to a story which 
I hope is familiar to us all, called David and Goliath. But instead of calling it David and Goliath, in which, of course, the young, courageous man kills the older bully, he reverses the title and he calls it Goliath and David. And already, in advance, of course, we are warned, aren't we, that something isn't quite as it should be. I think that's, that, that's the first sign. He says that it was the biblical order being deliberately changed, though the ending still comes as a shock. Um, his message, I think, in David and Goliath, and I'll read just a bit in a minute, is that actually brute strength wins, that courage and valor and, and all sorts of, of idealism do not triumph over brute strength and cold steel, which, of course, is a very shocking message, and even more shocking when it's clothed in allegory, because when you read it, you expect David to triumph over Goliath, don't you? Doesn't David fight the giant and win him with just sort of his bare wood, whereas Goliath's got his, seat, his shield and all the rest of it? Um, so the reader themselves has to work out what has happened, why has the order been res res reversed. Um, it's an extremely effective poem, both on the personal and public level, and because the grief and the horror is kind of subdued, and you're working it out for yourself, and it ends, steel crosses wood, a flash, and oh, shame for beauty's overthrow. God's eyes are dim, his ears are shut. One cruel backhand sabre cut, I'm hit, I'm killed, young David cries. Throws blindly forward, chokes and dies, steel helmeted and grey and grim. Goliath straddles over him. So it's all completely reversed. Um, and in case there's any doubt at all, and I'm going to stop now for a short break, in case there's any doubt at all as to Graves' criticism, his anger at the war, he includes an ironic marginal note in his book, uh, in his poem, which opens, war should be a sport for men above 55, only... The Jesses, not the David. So Jesse's the father, of course. Well, dear father, Jesse will, uh, David will say to Jesse, how proud I am of you serving your country as a, as a very gentleman, prepared to make even the supreme sacrifice. I only wish I were your age. How willingly would I buckle on my armor and fight these unspeakable um, Philistines? And so, through this myth, Graves, universalizes the tragedy of all the brave and beautiful young men who died fighting in a war they believed in initially at least. And um, I think really that's all I want to say about Graves, but I want to give you a break anyway, but we're coming back to Sassoon and those more familiar poems that you know of his afterwards. Thank you. rather impressive. I said, but if you give them a lavatory break, they'll all disappear. <laughs> and you haven't. <laughs> well done. Um, so when, when Graves um, was in France, then he met Sassoon. And really, it was a fascinating event, because by meeting Sassoon, he also, in a sense, passed on influence, because Sassoon influenced Owen, 
So there's a kind of line of, of people being influenced originally by graves. You can tell I'm writing a book on graves. Please forgive me if I said too much. Okay, so I want to start now with Siegfried Sassoon after he met Robert Graves in November 1915 and under similar conditions which influenced him, including the death of David Thomas, with whom you remember they were all both excitingly in love. And one of the earliest of what Sassoon calls his genuine trench poems, and this is a quote from Sassoon, aimed at impersonal description of frontline conditions, is the Redeemer. No, that's not it. Shall now, you know what Sassoon looks like, don't you? Yeah, but I won't try and get back to him. I may, lo I may lose, or, w or will I? There we are. There's Sassoon, painted by uh, Philpott. The, the Redeemer is based on that one first tour of trenches. And it's, it's an amazing poem from somebody who'd written about the anguish of the earth absolving our eyes, because it ends with the soldier who's been in the trenches in the poem taking large planks of wood down the trench, rather like the figure of Christ with the cross. Um, and it ends very shockingly with the floundering soldier in the muddy trench uttering the unheroic, not to say blasphemous words, Oh Christ Almighty, now I'm stuck. Not quite what people had come to expect from this romantic young poet, Siegfried Sassoon. It's a work in strong contrast to, to absolution. It's a work full of concrete details of frontline conditions, even down to the echo of the language used by the soldiers. And of course, that ending is deliberately shocking. Um, the, I mean, the poem opens, darkness, the rain sluiced down the ma was deep, that kind of detail that you get. By February 1916, so that was November 1915, Sassoon is writing what he calls his first outspoken war poem, In the Pink. And you probably know that the phrase, in the pink, is one of the phrases that was used in the First World War on those postcards. They'd say, I'm well, I'm not terribly well, I'm in hospital, I'm this, that and the other, or I'm in the pink, in the pink of health, of course. And this is repeated time and again in the poem itself for ironic ends. It's a foundation for a formula which really goes through the rest of those war poems. Um, so Davis wrote, This leaves me in the pink, then scrawled his name, Your loving sweetheart, Willie, with crosses for a hug. It had a drink of rum and tea, and though the barn was chilly, for once his blood ran warm. He had pay to spend, winter was passing, soon the war year would mend. But he couldn't sleep that night, stiff in the dark, he groaned, and thought of Sundays at the farm. And how he'd go as cheerful as a lark with his best suit to wander arm in arm with brown-eyed Gwen and whisper in her ear the simple, silly things she liked to hear. And then he thought, tomorrow night we trudge up to the trenches and my boots are rotten. Five miles of stodgy clay and freezing sludge and everything but wretchedness forgotten. Tonight he's in the pink, but soon he'll die. And still the war goes on. He don't know why. So this is the formula, the, the, the simple verse form. No pyrotechnics to distract us from the content. And the six-line stanza ending with a rhyming couplet to drive home the point, particularly that one at the end, and still the war goes on. He don't know why, rhyming, of course, with die. The language is also simple and colloquial, partly to help create the soldier's working class background. He can't even write, of course. He signs his name with a cross. 
but also to express more bluntly the nastiness of war. So um, the phrase in the pink is, is, is repeated time and again three times in all actually to underline ironically the fact that the soldier is not in the pink of health. And even if he were, it would be short-lived. His boots are frankly rotten. It's not, oh, my boots are no good. That's what an officer might say. His boots are rotten, rather than politely inadequate. And as the narrator concludes in a phrase which doesn't quite avoid the charge of condescension, he echoes the uneducated soldier's thoughts while at the same time emphasizing his bewilderment. He don't know why. The few rhetorical flourishes are kept deliberately simple by the man, imagining himself as nothing more sophisticated than cheerful as a lark. Quite, quite a simple idea, that. And the narrator repeating in the pink for his own ironic ends. But it's not until Sassoon turns to direct satire and even more colloquial diction that his work reflects his true vision of war. That is, that all the suffering and slaughter are pointless and that men's lives are being thrown away by the interference or perhaps simply the unawareness or stu sheer stupidity of the men at the top predominantly the general staff and politicians, although the church does come in for a bit of a bashing, and the press also. One of the best examples of this type of poem is a piece you probably know. It's always when I go to parties and people say politely, what are you writing? And I say, oh, about war poets. And they say, oh, yes, I know. Good morning, good morning, the general said. <laughs> Very impressive, I think. <laughs> But um, you can see from this how skillfully Sassoon does this, how he points out um, in, in this poem, he, he does a little sketch, a little thumbnail sketch of the situation. We, we set the scene ourselves in a way, and how radically the, um, the, the tone changes at the end. Good morning, good morning, the general said, when we met him last week on our way to the line. And the soldiers he smiled at are most of them dead and were cursing his staff for incompetent swine. He's a cheery old card, grunted Harry to Jack as they slugged, slogged up to Arras with rifle and pack. But he did for them both by his plan of attack. And Sassoon had written originally in that last line, but he murdered them both by his plan of attack. And his very conventional uh, civil servant friend, Edward Marsh, who was an aide to Winston Churchill at one point, said, you cannot have that line in there. They'll censor it. So he put, did for them both, which I think is better. I think the euphemism is actually better. <laughs> so soon had originally, sorry, so he was at the Battle of the Somme in July 1916, first day of the Somme. He's left a long description of that. And at Arras in April 1917, and what he saw there hardened his attitude towards war further, leading in July 1917 to his famous public protest against the war. It was for the fighting men that my appeal was made, he wrote. I won't, um, I won't read the whole of it here because there isn't time, but you might like to just hear a few phrases which I think sets the tone. He's protesting on behalf, not of himself, he's quite a toughie. He likes going out and fighting. He's called Mad Jack, but for the men who are suffering enormously. I believe, he writes in his protest, that the war is being deliberately prolonged by those who have the power to end it. He'd heard of German peace talks which had been rejected and he was very angry indeed. I have seen and endured the suffering of the troops and I can no longer be a party to prolonging these sufferings for ends which I, I believe to be evil and unjust. Well, of course, he left the authorities. It's a terrible problem. He's a brave soldier. He'd won an MC by this time, by 1916. He, he won it in 1916, so that was a whole year before. And he was a brave fighter. And he'd been in the war from the start. So what could they do? 
And what they did was very clever. To, he got it published in the Times by um, having it read out in Parliament, so they were able to publish it in the Times in Hansard. And this meant that everybody knew about the protest. They couldn't, well, I mean, he was very brave. He could have been court-martialed, could even have been shot. Although, of course, seeing it in retrospect, we think, well, he couldn't have been. I mean, what would they have done if they'd shot a hero like that? So he presented them with a real problem. But cleverer than he was, they sent him off to a mental hospital. Oh, you're suffering from shell shock, they said, which he was not. And it was at the mental hospital that he met two of the most important people in his life, Dr. Rivers, who comes into Pat Barker's regeneration, read it if you haven't, and also Wilfred Owen, as, as we'll see. Sorry, I thought I had, I thought I was going to read you something else, and I'm not. You're going to be deprived of any more poetry of, of Siegfried Sassoon. The most cogent and argument for First World War poetry is perhaps, there we are, is, oh, yes, no, let me read you that one, um, because I do think, I, th I do think this is the best of, of, of Siegfried. I knew there was one more poem. It must have slipped out in some way. Um, but the, the best, um, the best of the, of the war poem seems to me, Does It Matter, um, where he mixes a kind of tremendous compassion which you get in Wilfred Owen with this hard satire which he had started off by being so good at. And I think it's this combination, it's the toughness and the lyricism together which work so well. Um, and he'd just been, um, he'd been with friends, one of whom had lost his arm and was a pianist, another who had gone mad and was in Craig Lockett, the mental hospital, and another man who had um, lost his eyesight. And his own great fear was of being blinded in the war because he loved colours. Does it matter, he asks, losing your legs? For people will always be kind, and you need not show that you mind when others come in after hunting to gobble their muffins and eggs. Does it matter? losing your sight. There's such splendid work for the blind, and people will always be kind as you sit on the terrace, remembering and turning your face to the light. Do they matter, those dreams from the pit? You can drink and forget and be glad, and people won't say that you're mad, for they know you fought for your country, and no one will worry a bit. And I think the power of that, of course, is that there is compassion as you sit on the terrace remembering. I mean, this is a man who's a great sportsman. The idea of being damaged in any way is particularly difficult for someone like that. Edward Thomas, the most cogent argument, I think, for war poetry mattering. Because war poetry has to be good to justify its existence. I mean, we can go endlessly through the suffering of these men, but is the poetry any good? And I think Edward Thomas helps to answer that. He was older than the majority of the men who went out. He was born in 1778, so that's, uh, sorry, 1878. Always get my centuries wrong, just be warned. Um, and he didn't volunteer immediately. Because he was married, he had three children. But then when he did, he, he went into the artist rifles like Wilfred Owen to begin with, and then into the most um, pugilistic arm, the royal, uh, uh, the royal Artillery, the Royal Garrison Artillery, which of course is sort of frontline stuff. Even before the infantry, the Royal Garrison Artillery would be on the, on the front. And he died on the first day of the Battle of Arras. It's always rather nice when people have an anniversary that people can remember. I mean, like Rosenberg dying on the 1st of April, April Fool's Day. He'd first turned Thomas from prose to poetry, because they hadn't written any real poetry up to 1915, 1914. Um, and he turned to poetry 
partly because of the war itself, partly because he, wrote, he met that marvelous American poet, Robert Frost. And Frost, who was a poet already, said to him, you know, you write such lyrical prose poems, you ought to be writing poems. And when the war came and his journalistic commissions in prose dried up, he tried his hand at a little poetry. So he was already writing poetry by the time uh, the war broke out. No, just, just after the war broke out. And he wrote the most extraordinary poems about the war. They don't seem to be about the war, but they are written in the shadow of the war. He'd been writing an anthology of English pieces in which he tries to sum up what it is to be English and what it is to feel English. Um, and it made him feel very patriotic. And he decided that if he loved England in the way he realized he did love England and her land and her customs, he could not, at the same time, refuse to fight to defend her. So this was a problem a lot of the war poets encountered. At one stroke, I thought, he said in an essay called This England, I thought, like many other people, what things that same new moon, he's looking at the new moon, what same things that new moon sees eastward about the river Meurs in France, of those who could see it there, not blinded by smoke pain or excitement. How many saw it? And he did. All I can tell is, it seemed to me that I never loved England or I loved it foolishly, aesthetically, like a slave, if he didn't volunteer. And then there's that other moment, which I do hope is true. It's come down in Thomas' legend, which is when his friend Eleanor Fargin, another poet and writer, said to him, what are you doing this for? Why are you enlisting? And he bent down, picked up the earth, and they were in the country, and he said, literally, for this, for the countryside that he had enjoyed so much, crumbled it between his finger and thumb and let it fall. And he's a rather enigmatic figure in the war poets because he occupies a sort of central ground between the Rupert Brooks and between the Siegfried Sassoon's in his most aggressive mood. His far more measured approach, I think, is more similar to Charles Hamilton Sawley. A poem like This Is No Case of Petty Right or Wrong, which I won't read in full, shows that, in fact, his attitude is in between, because he says, this is no case of petty right or wrong that politicians or philosophers can judge. I hate not Germans, nor grow hot with love of Englishmen to please newspapers, whereas his father, who was very bellicose and very jingoistic, was saying it's disgraceful. And he was saying, no, no, it's not a, it's not a petty case of right or wrong. It's a complicated situation. But Thomas's reaction to the war, which he joined reluctantly at a later stage, um, continued to be a more indirect one. And it's here that his finest poetry lies. Now, I just want to look at one poem. No, not that one. These are, these are more direct poems when he writes about the, the flowers left thick at nightfall in the wood this Easter tide. Call into mind the men now far from home who, with their sweethearts, should have gathered them and will do never again. It's uh, like a little Japanese haiku, isn't it, really? And, and another lovely poem that I'd love to talk to you about, about a ploughman uh, summing up, really, the sort of rural life of, of England, a ploughman who goes out to France and used to sleep out on the downs because he, either because he preferred his beer or because he was rather feckless with money because he had nowhere to stay. Uh, and now, at last, he sleeps more sound in France. The poem ends, and we know what that euphemism means, don't we? The poem that I really want to just look at before we move on is as the team's head brass, and the head brass is the harness that they put on horses in brass, which flashes 
as the horses plow the fields. And it's a typical country scene with the plowman plowing and the soldier sitting on the stump of a log and discussing the war between them. It's, it's beautifully done. Of course, I've been far too indulgent with Sassoon and Graves and all the rest of it, so we can't really read it. But if you look at it, you'll realize that behind it um, lies the Thomas Hardy poems and get the same thing. You get, as the team's head brass flashed out on the turn, the lovers disappeared into the wood. And, and so at the beginning of the poem, the lovers disappear into the wood, don't ask why. And at the end, the lovers um, come out of the wood again and the horses start on their plowing once more. It's a poem about the country, about the rhythms of the country. And to some extent, like Hardy's, it's a poem about the continuity of things, how that wars will come and go, but these things, well, of course, they didn't, did they? I mean, who saw, who's seen any plow horses recently? Would you like to put your hand up? <laughs> I mean, you know, these things don't quite continue in the same form, but the farm work continues, and the habits of the countryside and the rituals of the countryside. Um, but it's a, it's a poem which starts with the, the soldier and the plowman talking, and because they're talking, it's a dialogue and nobody's saying. It's a, non, it's a non-judgmental poem, and, and how these people, in time to come, maybe the soldier will come back, maybe he won't. In this case, this particular soldier, the narrator, Edward Thomas, does not come back. He dies, as I've told you, on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. And so it's another poem, like Hardy's, about war's intrusion into rural England, centering around the commonplace activity of ploughing. And even the imagery in the poem, the fallen elm, treading me down, scraping the share, screwing along the... They're all allusions, I think, indirect allusions to the war. And a poem set within the recurring cycle of nature, including human nature, with those lovers going into the wood and out again at the end. It's a circular poem, as a number of poems we've read today are. But the next to last poet I want to talk about is Isaac Rosenberg. Perhaps, well, I find him the most interesting because he's the most challenging of all the poets, I would say. Um, and of course, especially interesting to you because he was in Cape Town with his sister who lived in District 6 when the war broke out and he had no intention of going to fight, although he felt fairly patriotic. He hoped the Germans would get their comeuppance very shortly, of course, but he wasn't patriotic. He didn't rush home like Wilfred Owen in, in France. He didn't rush home. Rosenberg was born in the slums of Bristol of immigrant Lithuanian Jews he grew up in the East End of London without any of the benefits of education or money enjoyed by most of those officer poets. So that when he eventually joined the army in 1915, it was as a private and not as an officer. Unable to find work congenial to his artistic nature, he was a painter as well as a poet, which makes him particularly good and which, of course, to some extent accounts for the vividness of his poetry. This is a painter telling us about the scene. He'd been visiting his sister in Cape Town when the war broke out. He was not much over five feet, he was about my height, and he was therefore too small for the regulation army because in those days you had to be five foot three, he was five foot two. Um, and when it became clear that people would have to enlist and that conscription was coming in, he did eventually join up. He said it wasn't for patriotic reasons. He said it was to help his mother with the army pay. And he joined what they called a Bantam Battalion. This is his self-portrait of himself, which I think is rather beautiful. I think you, you can see that he's an interesting and romantic person from those eyes. He was sent out to France um, after serving miserably in this Bantam 
Battalion with the King's own Royal Lancasters in mid-1916, and therefore, with his usual ill luck, was there for the Battle of the Somme. Extraordinarily, he escaped unhurt, um, and it was, it was amazing that he also survived another battle that he was due to take part in, the Battle of Bourlong Wood in 1917, only to be killed a year or less than a year later on April the 1st, 1918, in that great German spring offensive which followed when they tried to contain the Allies, uh, sorry, yes, contain the Allies, the Germans' great, last great push of the war. And it seems entirely appropriate and in keeping with his rather sad, slightly miserable life that he should die on April Fool's Day. I want to read one poem of Rosenberg's, a poem which Paul Fussell, who's a great critic of that First World War period, has called the best, the greatest poem of the First World War. And this is Break of Day in the Trenches. And it's a poem which I think, again, is slightly different, slightly different from what Sassoon is doing, from what Thomas is doing, from what Grace is doing. I don't know anybody who writes like Rosenberg. He identifies with the little rat that he meets in the trenches. It's quite a delightful little rat, a very whimsical little rat, rather like this cheeky, frisky rat. Um, and, of course, it's based on an experience that all soldiers everywhere knew, which was a dawn um, sentry duty. And, of course, the trenches were running with vermin, particularly rats. And most people hated the rats. Isaac Rosenberg, it seems, rather identified with the, this little rat, as you will see. The darkness crumbles away. It is the same old druid time as ever. Only a live thing leaps my hand, a queer sardonic rat, as I pull the parapet's poppy to stick behind my ear. Droll rat, they would shoot you if they knew your cosmopolitan sympathies. Now you have touched this English hand, you will do the same to a German soon, no doubt, if it be your pleasure to cross the sleeping green between no man's land, of course. It seems you inwardly grin as you pass strong eyes, fine limbs, haughty athletes, less chanced than you for life. Bonds to the whims of murder sprawled in the bowels of the earth, the torn fields of France. What do you see in our eyes at the shrieking iron and flame hurled through still heavens? What quaver, what heart aghast, Poppies whose roots are in men, man's veins drop and are ever dropping. But mine in my ear is safe, just a little white with the dust. And of course, here he sets up a contrast between the red poppies and the white dust of the trenches where he is. Um, and you know how poppies drop very quickly. They don't, they don't last for very long. And both of them, of course, dust and poppies linked to mortality. Rosenberg then proceeds to add another familiar feature of life, the, of trench life, the rat. And at the same time, he paints in a fully realized setting of the trenches, which include that sleeping green between, that piece of land, although I'm not sure how green it would be at that point, piece of land between the opposing lines. Technically neutral ground, of course, to which he will put symbolic use. In setting the scene ambiguously at dawn, that sort of half light, Rosenberg is able to signify a wider, less obvious range of emotions and themes. His opening line lines indicate that he'll be dealing with an experience common to all soldiers, that sentry duty at dawn. And uh, listen hard, because it, it comes from Cape Town, this image. The darkness crumbles away. It is the same old druid time as ever. And the darkness crumbles away is a phrase he uses when he's describing Sea Point, 
There's a, po there's a poem called Sea Point, and you know the way the cliffs are eroded slightly, and this crumbling is then used to describe the darkness, which I think is lovely. It's just a sort of strange connection to have made, isn't it, between them. And time as a priest in an ancient religious ritual, it is the same old druid time as ever. It is puzzling only until we discover Rosenberg's original explanation to Marsh that he, Edward Marsh, that he wanted to convey the sanctity of dawn. That's why he uses that religious imagery and the central, simple action of the place, of the piece then takes place when the rat, the only alive thing, leaps my hand, a queer, sardonic rat, as I pull the parapet's poppy to put behind my ear. So you've got two things happening. The rat jumps over his hand and he sticks the poppy. And at the end, having had a discussion with the rat about how ridiculous it is, they're sitting in their little holes on either side of this neutral ground. And the rat, the lowliest of all, is running freely between them, more chanced than the haughty athletes for life. It's, a, it's beautifully done and conceived, isn't it? And I think if you read it another time, you'll see that comes out. And uh, of course, I do love that little sarcasm, droll rat, they would shoot you if they knew your cosmopolitan sympathies. I mean, fancy kissing an English or touching an English hand and then touching a German one. Um, and stripped of its usual frontline connotations of the hated scavenger, Rosenberg's rat becomes a symbol of neutrality, free to cross national boundaries, and in doing so, point up the absurdity of war. It's a lovely poem, and I could talk about it forever, but I mustn't, because you'd never forgive me if I didn't get on to your favorite, I'm sure, Wilfred Owen. You see, it's terrible. We all, feel, we all feel bludgeoned by the popularity of Owen. I think he's a fantastic poet, by the way. <laughs> I'm not knocking Owen. I'm just trying to defend some of my own poets, like Edward Thomas and Isaac Rosenberg. Last but by no means least comes Wilfred Owen. A halfway house, as it were, between the extreme deprivation of, Rosen, of Rosenberg and the complete privilege of the aristocratic Julian Grenfell, brought up in a lower middle class household which nevertheless respected culture and education. He had neither public school nor university education. He did, however, win himself sufficient knowledge to be able to go as a tutor to France in 19, I think it was 1913, and he was still in France when the war broke out and initially had no intention of coming back to England. When he did eventually, he went straight into the artist rifles in September, the, uh, in, oh, sorry, in October 1915, just as the Battle of the Somme had been abandoned for the winter of 1916-17, he was sent out. And once involved in the horrors of trench warfare, his main mission in life was to express in poetry what he memorably but simply called the pity of war. Not anger so much as pity at what has happened to people there, innocent young men like the man in the poem I'm about to read, a farmhand who grew up going out every morning into the sun to look after the fields and look after the animals. And this best exp expresses, I think, the pity that he feels. Move him into the sun. Gently its touch awoke him once at home, whispering of fields unsown. Always it woke him, even in France, until this morning and this snow. If anything might rouse him now, the kind old son will know. Think how it wakes the seeds, woke once the clays of a cold star. Our limbs 
so dear achieved, our sides full nerved, still warm, too hard to stir. Was it for this the clay grew tall? Oh, what made fatuous sunbeams toil to break earth's sleep at all? There's a lot there, a great, great deal, isn't there, about how the sun is life-giving, how at home he awoke in the morning to tend the fields, and now all of that, the sun, for all its vigor and power, can do nothing to bring him back. Was it for this, the clay, and of course, man made out of the clay of the earth, was it for this the clay grew tall? By May 1917, after four months of unbelievable hardship, Owen was diagnosed, as, as I may have mentioned, as suffering from shell shock and evacuated to Craig Lockett, whereby one of those amazing coincidences, and there are a number of them in the First World War, he met Siegfried Sassoon. So Sassoon had met Graves, and Graves had, had then gone off to other things, and, and Sassoon had then met Owen. Just as Graves had introduced Sassoon to realistic war poetry and had been surpassed by him in it, so Sassoon introduced Owen and was in turn surpassed by him, I think. I think I have to say that, even though I should be defending Sassoon, because, of course, he has a breadth that, that Sassoon mostly doesn't have. Sometimes, like Does It Matter, I think you get a touch of the pity and the compassion that you get in Owen. But on the whole, that is very much um, subdued to the anger. Before meeting Sassoon, Owen's poetry had beauty, but no real power. After meeting Sassoon, whom he worshipped, absolutely adored him, I'm sure he was also was homosexual, he, he talks in his diary about um, um, his He's, uh, he's seen Sassoon, and the colour of his eyes reflected in the, his blue eyes reflected in the, the colour of his dressing gown. Well, if that isn't hero worship, what is? Um, but he, he worshipped him, but he, he listened to him. And Sassoon said to him, you know, I think you should be concentrating a bit more on what war is actually like, and you've seen it, and you've suffered, and you've had shell shock. Why not write about that? Don't be so romantic about it. And so passed on the very important message Graves had sent to Sassoon. And to begin with, Owen's poetry does acquire a, a tremendous power. It isn't fully formed, I wouldn't say. I mean, I agree with Ingrid that dolce et decorum est, which of course, as you know, means it is sweet and proper or fitting to die for one's country. And of course, all those public schoolboys with their Latin would have known that. Um, and it's a schoolboy, it's a public school motto, isn't it? Dulce et decorum est, very proper to die for your country. But um, I think this poem, Dulce et decorum est, we'll, we'll have it up here, is, is a very powerful poem, but it hasn't quite got the full compassion of, of the poem that I want to end with, which is Anthem for Doomed Youth. They're going back from an attack, and they're suddenly invaded by gas. And that was one of the horrors of the First World War, gas. And, and he's describing what it is like to be in such an attack. And what is it like to witness such an attack? Then double, like old beggars under sacks, knock need coughing like hags we cursed through sludge till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge but limped on blood shod all went lame all blind drunk with fatigue deaf even to the hoots of tired outstripped five nines that dropped behind their shells of course gas gas quick boys an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or line. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. <laughs> 
in all my dreams. Before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes rising in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the curd of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie, dolce et decorum est pro patria mori. A great deal of anger there. There is compassion. There's a great deal of identification, and it's clear that it has haunted him since it happened. Gradually, however, Owen finds his own voice, which, while remaining critical of the horrors of war, has an added lyric beauty and, as I say, compassion. In Anthem for Doomed Youth, for instance, very much helped by Sassoon, who supplied quite a number of the words there between two choices that Owen gave him. Fascinating to see the manuscript, you know. He said, should it be this or should it be that? Sassoon's very authoritatively ticked the right word. So this is a Sassoon Owen poem. I'm joking, of course, it's Owen's own poem. It's the most moving, I think, for me, <clears throat> of the war poems. It's ironic contrast between the church's funeral service with its, quote, passing bell, orisons, or prayers, choir, candles, pools, and the real fate of the soldiers who died, quote, like cattle on the battlefield. So there are these contrasts. There's the church service on the one hand with all those words that we use, and the real funeral or anthem for them is what? Guns? Memories? What is it? What passing bells for these? Let's do this properly. What passing bells for these who die as cattle? Only the monstrous anger of the guns. Only the stuttering rifles' rapid rattle can patter out their hasty orisons. No mockeries now for them. No prayers, nor bells, nor any voice of mourning, save the choirs, the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells and bugles calling for them from sad shires. What candles may be held to speed them all? Not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes shall shine the holy glimmers of goodbyes. The pallor of girls' brows shall be their pall, their flowers, the tenderness of patient minds, and each slow dusk a drawing down of blinds.